April 10th, 1963, 220 miles east of Cape Cod, the nuclear submarine USS Thresher is conducting deep dive tests when the control room receives a garbled message from the engine room, experiencing minor problem, attempting to blow. 60 seconds later, a Navy surface ship listening above hears a sound no submariner ever wants to hear, the hull collapsing. The implosion is so violent it registers on coastal seismographs. 129 men die instantly at a depth where the ocean pressure exceeds 5,000 pounds per square inch. If this story gave you chills or made you respect the silent warriors of the deep, hit that like button. Not for the algorithm, but for the 129 souls who never surfaced again. USS Thresher never surfaces. This is what happens when a nuclear submarine gets hit underwater. And today, we're going to examine the physics, the weapons, the desperate final minutes, and why. Despite every safety system, every training drill, every backup procedure, getting hit below the surface is almost always fatal. To understand what happens when a submarine is hit, you first need to understand what it's designed to withstand and what will kill it. A nuclear submarine's hull is a marvel of engineering. The pressure hull, the inner cylinder that holds atmosphere, is made of high-yield steel several inches thick. Modern submarines can dive to depths exceeding 800 feet. Russian Akula-class submarines reportedly exceed 1,900 feet. At those depths, every square inch of hull endures pressure, equivalent to stacking two cars on a postage stamp. But that strength has limits, exceed the crush depth, the point where pressure overcomes hull integrity and the submarine implodes in milliseconds. The air inside compresses so rapidly, it superheats to thousands of degrees. Death is instantaneous. Now add combat damage. Anti-submarine weapons are specifically designed to exploit the submarine's greatest vulnerability. It's trapped underwater. A surface ship can take a hit flood compartments and stay afloat. A submarine has nowhere to go but down, and down means death. Three weapon types dominate modern anti-submarine warfare. Torpedoes, depth charges, and mines. Each is designed to either rupture the hull directly or create shockwaves that catastrophically damage internal systems. But the real killer isn't the explosion itself. It's what happens in the seconds or afterward. Flooding, fire, loss of propulsion, loss of depth control. When a submarine is hit underwater, time collapses. The crew has minutes, sometimes seconds, to save the boat before physics takes over. And physics always wins. Let's start with the torpedo, the submarine's deadliest enemy. Modern torpedoes like the American Mark 48 or Russian Type 53 are guided missiles underwater. They carry warheads weighing several hundred pounds and can travel at speeds exceeding 55 knots, faster than most submarines can run. They're smart, using active sonar, passive sonar, and wake-homing technology to track targets through twisting evasive maneuvers. When a torpedo detonates against a submarine hull, the explosion doesn't just blast a hole, it creates a shock wave that propagates through water far more efficiently than through air. That shock wave hits the submarine like a hammer, rupturing welds, shattering equipment, and killing sailors instantly, even in compartments far from the impact. But most modern torpedoes don't hit the hull directly. They're designed to explode underneath the target. Here's why. When a torpedo detonates beneath a submarine, it creates a gas bubble that expands rapidly upward. The submarine, suddenly unsupported, drops into the void. Then the bubble collapses, and the submarine gets slammed upward by a water jet, moving at hundreds of miles per hour. This whipsaw motion, down then up, breaks the keel. The spine of the submarine snap. No amount of damage control can fix a broken keel. Then there are depth charges, the blunt instrument of anti-submarine warfare. Dropped or launched from surface ships and aircraft, they sink to a preset depth before exploding. Modern depth charges use proximity fuses, detonating when they detect a submarine nearby. The shockwave alone can crush ballast tanks, rupture piping, and disable electronics. And finally, mines. Naval mines are anchored to the seafloor in strategic choke points, straits, harbor entrances, patrol routes. They wait silent and patient until a submarine passes overhead. Then they detonate, sending the explosion upward into the thinnest part of the hull. Submarines have almost no defense against mines in shallow water. These are the weapons. Now let's talk about what happens when they hit. Imagine you're a sonar operator aboard a submarine. You've been tracking a contact for 20 minutes. Another submarine may be a surface ship. Then your headphones explode with sound. 
High-speed propellers, unmistakable. Incoming torpedo. The captain orders evasive maneuvers. The submarine turns hard, diving deeper, launching countermeasures. Acoustic decoys designed to lure the torpedo away. The crew braces. Everyone knows. If the torpedo is modern and close, evasion is unlikely. Then impact. The explosion doesn't sound like Hollywood. It's a deafening crack followed by the roar of inrushing water. The lights go out. Emergency reds kick in. The submarine lists violently to one side. Alarms scream, and everyone knows instantly we're flooding. Yeah, the damage control team has seconds to assess the breach. Where is it? How big? Can we seal it? In the forward torpedo room, water is blasting in through a three-foot rupture. The pressure at 400 feet depth means seawater enters at 173 pounds per square inch, a fire hose of ocean filling the compartment in seconds. The crew tries to close the watertight door, but sailors are still inside, struggling against the current. The choice is brutal. Seal the door and save the submarine, or leave it open and lose everyone. They seal the door. The men trapped inside have perhaps two minutes before the compartment floods completely. Some try to reach emergency breathing devices. Others swim toward pockets of air near the ceiling, but the water is freezing. 38 degrees Fahrenheit. Hypothermia and drowning happen fast. Meanwhile, in the control room, the captain faces a new nightmare. The submarine is losing depth control. The flooded compartment has added tons of weight to the bow. The boat is angling downward, sinking toward crush depth. The chief of the boat orders emergency ballast blow, forcing compressed air into ballast tanks to create buoyancy. But the damaged tanks won't hold pressure. The air hisses out uselessly. They're still sinking, 600 feet, 700. The hull begins to groan. Rivets pop, small leaks appear in pipe joints, spraying seawater into compartments that were dry seconds ago. The crew knows what's coming. Some pray, some grip their station, some think of families they'll never see again. At 1,300 feet, well past the submarine's rated crush depth, the hull gives way. When a submarine exceeds its crush depth, the failure is not gradual, it's instantaneous and total. The pressure hull is designed to distribute stress evenly like an arch, but when one section weakens from battle damage, corrosion, or exceeding depth limit, the entire structure fails at once. The hull collapses inward at supersonic speed, faster than the human nervous system can register pain. The air inside compresses so violently, it reaches temperatures exceeding 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit in milliseconds, hot enough to ignite anything flammable. In the same instant, the shock wave from the implosion pulverizes organic matter. Death is instantaneous. No one suffers. This is what happened to USS Thresher in 1963. After a piping failure caused flooding, the crew attempted to blow ballast tanks, but ice formed in the compressed airlines, a design flaw no one anticipated. The submarine couldn't stop sinking. At 2,400 feet, the hull imploded. Debris spread across the seafloor in a pattern consistent with total structural failure. 129 men died. The Navy recovered only small fragments, a workbench, a section of piping, a boot. But implosion isn't the only killer. Sometimes the submarine stays intact, and that's worse. In August 2000, the Russian submarine course was conducting exercises in the Barents Sea when a torpedo malfunction caused a massive explosion in the forward compartment. The blast killed the entire forward crew instantly and opened the hull to the sea. The submarine sank to the seafloor at 354 feet, shallow enough that implosion wasn't a concern, but 23 sailors survived in the aft compartments. They sealed themselves in, wrote letters to their families, and waited for rescue. Russian naval forces knew the submarine was down. They knew men were alive, but pride, bureaucracy, and equipment failures delayed international rescue efforts. The sailors lasted 18 hours, then the air ran out. Their bodies were recovered weeks later, letters still in their pocket. Not every hit is fatal immediately. Sometimes the submarine stays afloat, barely, and the crew gets a chance to fight back. This is where training meets chaos. Submarine damage control is the most intense training in the Navy. Sailors drill endlessly. Firefighting in zero visibility, sealing pipe ruptures while water blasts at face level, managing reactor emergencies while the boat is flooding. They wear breathing apparatuses, drag heavy equipment through narrow passages, and make split-second decisions that determine whether everyone lives or dies. When a submarine is hit, 
The first priority is always the same. Stop the flooding. Damage control teams rush to the breach with wooden wedges, rubber patches, metal plates, anything to slow the water. But at depth, the pressure is immense. A small hole becomes a cutting jet. Even temporary patches blow out within minutes. If flooding can't be stopped, the next option is isolating the compartment. Watertight doors, massive steel barriers seal off flooded sections, sacrificing part of the submarine to save the rest. This decision haunts commanders. Sometimes, sailors are still inside when the door closes. Sometimes, they bang on the door, screaming to be let out. The door stays closed. Next, restore buoyancy. If ballast tanks are damaged or flooded compartments have added weight, the submarine sinks. The crew blows every available tank, pumps water overboard, and jettisons anything heavy that's not essential. In extreme cases, they blow the main ballast tanks with emergency pressure, a violent procedure that can damage systems, but might be the only way to reach the surface. And then there's the reactor. Nuclear submarines depend on the reactor for propulsion, electricity, and life support. But in combat damage scenarios, the reactor becomes a liability. If cooling systems fail, the core overheats. If flooding reaches the reactor compartment, radiation leaks become inevitable. The crew has to decide, keep the reactor running to power systems or shut it down to prevent meltdown. These decisions happen in minutes, in chaos, while water rises and lights fail and the hull groans under pressure. And sometimes, despite perfect execution, despite courage and training and sacrifice, it's not enough. When a submarine goes down, Rescue becomes a race against time, depth, and physics. And physics almost always win. Modern navies operate Deep Submergence Rescue Vehicle, DSRVS, miniature submarines designed to dock with a distressed submarine and evacuate survivors. The US Navy's submarine rescue system can theoretically reach submarines at 2,000 feet depth, but deployment takes time. Mobilizing equipment, transporting it to the site, locating the submarine, and executing the rescue. In calm seas with perfect conditions, the fastest deployment takes 12 hours. Most submarine disasters happen in worse conditions, and 12 hours is an eternity when the air is running out. The biggest obstacle is depth. Most military submarines operate at depths exceeding the rescue system's rated capability. If a submarine sinks below 2,000 feet, no rescue vehicle can reach it. The crew is beyond help. Even in shallow water, Rescue is complicated. The submarine must be intact enough to maintain an airtight seal with the rescue vehicle. The hatch must be accessible and operable. The internal atmosphere must be breathable, not flooded, not filled with toxic smoke, not depleted of oxygen, and the crew must still be alive. In the history of submarine disasters, successful rescues are rare. The most famous is USS Qualos. In 1939, a diesel submarine that sank in 240 feet of water off New Hampshire, 33 sailors survived in the aft compartments. The Navy deployed a rescue bell, a precursor to modern DSRVs, and over 36 hours evacuated all survivors. It remains one of the only times a deep submarine rescue succeeded. Since then, most submarine disasters end with total loss. The ocean is vast, the depths are crushing, and time runs out faster than help can arrive. When a submarine is lost, the aftermath extends far beyond the ocean floor. The families of submariners live with unique dread. Unlike other military branches, submarine crews disappear for months at a time with no communication. When a submarine goes silent, families don't know if it's routine radio silence or disaster, they wait. Days pass. Then the Navy arrives at the door after USS Scorpion sank in May 1968 with 99 men aboard. Families waited five months before the wreckage was located. The Navy couldn't explain what happened. Explosion, collision, equipment failure, all theories, no certainty. The families never got closure, just probabilities and condolences. These disasters reshape naval policy. After Thresher, the US Navy implemented the Subsafe program, rigorous quality control for all submarine systems involving seawater integrity. Every weld, every valve, every pipe is tested and certified. Since Subsafe's implementation in 1963, no American submarine built to its standards has been lost, but Subsafe can't prevent combat damage. It can't stop a torpedo, and not every Navy operates with such a standard. The psychological impact on surviving submariners is profound. Those who've experienced fires, floods, or close calls describe a lasting hypervigilance. 
a constant awareness that the ocean is waiting, patient and inevitable. Some leave submarine service, others return, driven by duty, camaraderie, or the belief that their experience makes them better prepared. And they're right, submarine crews train harder than almost any military unit specifically because they know there are no second chances underwater. So what happens if a nuclear submarine gets hit underwater? The honest answer, almost everyone dies. The physics are unforgiving, the ocean is hostile, and rescue, despite all the technology and training and backup systems, is nearly impossible once disaster strikes. Submariners know that they accept it, and they go down anyway. But here's what makes submarine service extraordinary. It's not recklessness, it's calculated courage. Every submariner understands the risks and chooses to face them because the mission matters. Nuclear deterrence, the invisible shield that has prevented global war for 80 years, depends on submarines staying hidden, staying ready, staying silent. And that mission requires accepting that if something goes wrong, help probably won't arrive in time. The sailors who serve aboard submarines are volunteers. They undergo psychological screening, extensive training, and continuous evaluation. They're chosen not just for technical skill, but for the ability to remain calm when the lights go out. The water rises and the hull groans under impossible pressure. They're chosen because when disaster strikes, they don't panic. They fight, they seal the doors, they patch the leaks, they blow the ballast tanks. And if the boat can't be saved, they make sure their brothers have every possible second to survive. There are memorials in port cities around the world dedicated to submariners lost at sea. The inscriptions are simple. Names, date, depths, but they represent something profound. The willingness to descend into darkness, knowing you might not return, because the world above depends on people willing to do it. Submarines are called the silent service for a reason. They operate unseen. Their victories are classified, their sacrifices are often unknown, but their presence, the knowledge that somewhere beneath the waves, invisible guardians are watching, keeps the peace. And that's worth remembering the next time you see the ocean and wonder what's beneath the surface. If this video gave you a new appreciation for submarine service, check out our documentary on the most dangerous submarine missions ever attempted. Operations so classified, they weren't revealed for 50 years Click the link on screen. Thanks for watching. And remember, right now, at this very moment, submariners around the world are hundreds of feet underwater, standing watch in the darkness, so we don't have to.